Hi, it's me again. Are you surprised? <laughs> so I just wanted to do a video because that's now our thing. We now have a thing. We're doing videos. Um, I'm going to talk about a book here in a minute, but if you'll allow me, you know, indulge me, I'm going to riff for a second, see if I'm any good at it. So you know that when I do the main show and even when I do bonus episodes, I'm reading from a script because um, I don't trust myself to not ramble aimlessly with absolutely no end destination in sight. So I try to, you know, make sure that I'm structured and, you know, I know where I'm going. When I do this, it's very just, bah, 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 bah. What, what was I talking about again? I forget the point I was trying to make. It's very chaotic in this head. So it's the week before school starts for my kids. And uh, there's a kid at the door. <laughs> it's the week before school starts for my kids and I decorated the house and Halloween stuff. Um, I'm wearing Halloween clothes. I got Halloween earrings, can you see? And I'm just trying, trying, because these poor kids, they did not have a summer this year. They, you know, have been stuck at home. There was no vacation. There was no going to grandma's to go swimming. There was no, you know, trips to the ice cream store even. We didn't go to the little ice cream shop down the road. And God damn it, that's depressing. So, it's the Friday before school starts for them. School starts for them on Tuesday because uh, Monday is Labor Day. And um, so we've been trying to get them back on like the school time sleep schedule. And I've been dealing with some grumpy ass kids this week <laughs> because they're having to get up early. Before the rule was you have to be out of bed before noon. And a couple of days they we're out of bed at like 11.59 and being like, I, I was out before noon, mom. I was out before noon. And that's what was going on. So tonight I'm going to take them to um, Sonic because I mean, we've gotten food delivered and we've gotten drive through stuff, but I mean, we haven't been able to go to a restaurant since March, maybe, maybe even earlier. I think, honestly, I think the last time we went to a restaurant was on my birthday, which is at the end of February. And I mean, we still can't, we're still not, we're not doing that yet. So we're taking them to Sonic where at least it feels kind of like we're out, we'll eat in the van and you know, they can get ice cream there. So it's at least something, it's kind of a nice little thing before school starts. We're gonna go see some friends tomorrow and let them socialize a little bit, safe social distancing stuff outside and um you see you know i had a point i lost it <laughs> that's why we need the script but um that kid is distracting me there's a, a there's a dutch door at the my, my writing room is a, it's an add-on so you have to step down into it and the door that connects my writing room to the kitchen slash dining room is a dutch door and it's got a great big window in it and I'm just watching my youngest son just pacing by the door. He knows not to disrupt, so we'll be okay. So yeah, we're going to Sonic tonight. Uh, grumpy ass kids. They're gonna be doing assessment testing for the first day or two next week, which is never fun. So yeah, I guess I'm bleh. not looking forward to it. I've also been nursing a low grade hangover all day, which Son of a bitch, I had one drink last night. Now, it was a lethal drink and I had it with no food and I hadn't eaten in like seven, eight hours. So lethal drink on an empty stomach. I've learned my lesson. I'm drinking so much water. I tell you what, this getting old stuff and getting more frail and losing control of your body is bullshit. I'm not happy with it. <laughs> Let's get to the point. So the last bonus episode I did was on the book Red Dragon by Thomas Harris. Love that book. I totally recommend it. If you haven't read these, I can't recommend Thomas Harris, the writer, anymore. I really can't. And I liked The Silence of the Lambs. I did. I almost loved it. I did. I, I absolutely recommend it. Holy shit, read this book. But you know what? I'm tainted by the screen adaptations. There are a couple things with this book that 
just kind of bothered me overall. Now, spoilers, there are going to be spoilers in here. I'm making the assumption that you've at least seen the movie. So, I mean, the movie follows the storyline pretty damn close. A few little things change, nothing big, nothing that would have me screaming. I think, you know, I will never say it's okay to skip the book and watch the movie instead. Do, a, do both. Watch the movie and read the book and then compare notes. It's fun. I do it all the time. But um, you're you're not missing a whole lot if you haven't read the book. You know the story if you've just seen the movie. So one of the problems I kind of have with the book is the way Hannibal Lecter is portrayed. Simply because he became the star of Thomas Harris and his whole oof, well, I'm in love with that word right now. I know some people like to pronounce it oeuvre, but we're doing oeuvre. We're going to be pretentious. <laughs> but this is the second book where Hannibal Lecter is featured. He was in Red Dragon very, very short time. He was not featured in that book a lot at all. And he's got a much bigger part in this. We actually get um, a peek into his inner thinking in a scene, which I thought was really cool because part of Hannibal Lecter's mystique in the cinematic universe, including the show, is you never know what he's thinking. And I kind of wish that had been maintained. I don't want to know what he's thinking because that's what makes him scary. His true psychosis, his true way of thinking is never made clear. No matter how, you know, how in his head Will Graham can get, you never know. It's never made clear. So, you know, the, the pathology of Hannibal Lecter, it has to mean, it has to stay a mystery, at least in my opinion. It's not a lot that you get in here, um, like memories that he has of other dealings with especially Barney the uh, orderly at the asylum that he deals with I mean he thinks highly of Barney and he has memories of that and Barney's a good guy but another thing about Hannibal in this is he's crass and not for effect like he is in the movie where um he'll say stuff to kind of needle Clary Starling to kind of offend her to try to push her into a reaction he says, he does it often, where that's part of his personality, where he's crass and pretentious and he makes it obvious that he looks down on people, where, you know, in the, in the cinematic universe, he values manners, he values respect, and mutual respect is something he is absolutely willing to pay to people. And it doesn't look like that's something that happens so much in this book. He he says and does things that are annoying. And the other complaint that I have is something that's mentioned in Red Dragon, and he does it again here. And it's it's a, it's this really stupid petty gripe, but I don't like it. In Red Dragon, Thomas Harris talks about Francis Dollarhide having yellow eyes. Now sometimes that's symbolic. You will talk about you know the yellow eyes of the evil person, but no, it actually looks like Francis Dollarhide had yellow eyes. I know yellow eyes are a thing. I come from a family of alcoholics. I'm very well aware. But Francis Dollarhide isn't an alcoholic. He never drinks. And it just looks like that was like his personality coming out through his eyes, which, okay, I, I should allow that little bit of artistic flippancy. He does it to Hannibal though too. Hannibal Lecter has maroon colored eyes and there are points in his eyes that catch the light and make them look red. Come on, come on, really, can we not? Again, I should allow it. As a writer, I get really annoyed when editors try to stifle my own artistic flippancy, but I don't like that. Why does he have to have red eyes? <laughs> so another thing that kind of annoyed me about this book and they do it in the movie too is the talking about buffalo bills victims are of a certain size 
There's a reason why, you know, of course, because he starves them and then skins them, you know, starving them a little bit. They lose a lot of water. Their skin becomes a little looser, a little more saggy. Uh, but boy, they are just shitty about these women's weight in this book, which, when was this book first published? Um, I'm old enough to remember a time when there wasn't even a talk 1980 nope 1989 um i'm old enough to remember a time when there wasn't even a thought to be sensitive to different body types you were thin and you were healthy and you were good looking if you were not thin you were disgusting and worthy of derision um i come from a place where I, I mean, to put it simply, to be very bald about it, I come from a very lower class, white uh, family, white background, white trash, like Clary Starling. And being a daughter to a family who did not value female offspring, I was taught that the very worst thing I could be when I grew up was fat. The very worst thing a woman can be to so many of my background is fat. You can smoke four packs of cigarettes a day and walk around with brown teeth. You can, you know, not go to church. You can gossip. You can spit a big wad of snuff in the aisle at the grocery store. But as long as you're not fat, you're good. You're fine. So I think I'm kind of sensitive to this because they are gross and crass about it and even Clarice who is trying to get into the minds of the victims now unlike Will Graham who tries to get into the minds of the killer Clarice is trying to get into the minds of the victims she's trying to force herself to empathize which I think is a great you know uh bent towards the story I love it but she gets really gross about looking at the size particularly Buffalo Bill's first victim, Frederica Bimmel. She goes and looks at her room and she's just, there's always talk about fat pants and having to buy specialty things. And there's a humanness to wanting to see, you know, how Buffalo Bill saw them. You know, how was he hunting them? Because obviously size was an indicator in how he was choosing his victims. So you would want to know who sells this brand of sweatpants, but they're constantly called fat pants. And just a constant, you know, oh, this poor girl, she tried to be pretty with her, you know, pierced ears and her glitter nail polish, but she was still fat. She tried to save up to get her legs waxed, but she was still fat. And I mean, there's a story there. Not everybody needs to be 100% likable and that's good. That would actually annoy me. I don't want 100% altruistic people. I want flaws. But oh boy, that one got to me. Now something about this book that I do like is he deviates from the Red Dragon book where, you know, in Red Dragon we're forced to empathize with Francis Dollarhide. We are forced to see his background and how he, there is a side of him that is very pitiful. There is a side of him that is worthy of a little bit of pity, despite the monstrous things he does. We don't get that with Buffalo Bill. Um, they, and they do that in the movie too. You only know him as the guy raising the moths, sewing the suits, loving his dog. You don't, you don't get more than that. You really don't. And it's kind of fantastic because, you know, true crime it, it, as an entertainment form is kind of big right now. I feel two ways about it as, you know, I am a fan. I like learning about that kind of stuff. But on the flip side, I'm kind of grossed out by the people who become fans of the killers. That's kind of gross, right? Am I wrong? Am I offside here? I don't like that. So I feel two ways about um, being being a fan of true crime. And, you know, true crime documentaries and podcasts, they do tend to talk about the backgrounds of the killers. They do tend to talk about, you know, 
there's always something, there's always a background. You know, you rarely hear about someone who goes on these monstrous sprees who came from a well-adjusted family where they were loved and, you know, there are no complaints. There, there was always something that messed them up. Um, there's also a thing with head injuries. There's a really big line of, you know, famous serial killers who experienced um, massive head injuries as children. Not all of them. It's not universal. But I really liked that we didn't have a sad sap story about Buffalo Bill fed to us. He's just a bad guy. He's just a mess. And he dies very... There, there's no... With Francis Dollarhide, there was, a, there was a scene. You know, he really really hurts Will Graham in this fight where he sneaks to their house and you know he catches Will Graham in like a field and attacks him and he really damages Will Graham before Will's wife actually kills him there's a scene there with um Buffalo Bill with James Gum there isn't he gets her in the dark Clarice and, you know, he's watching her because it's a game. He really likes hunting people in this labyrinth of a basement that he has. And he likes to watch them in the dark through his goggles. And it's the same thing in the movie. She hears the gun cock and spins and shoots him. And I'm, that's just it. He's put down like a, like a rabid dog. And there's something... I really like the way that's handled, actually. Because... He's never, he doesn't treat his victims like humans. He doesn't talk to them. He doesn't relate to them. Um, and the, the fact that the author of the book in turn treats him that way, where you you know he's a human, but he is a monster. And that's all you see him as. I like that. I really like that. So I do like this book. I had, I mean, I had some problems. This book, famously, male authors can sometimes miss the mark when they're trying to write a female lead. But I think Thomas Harris did a great job. And he's doing something that's much more complicated than just a strong woman. He's writing a story about a strong woman trying to make her way in a very male-dominated power structure like the FBI she's not just trying to work her way up in a business world she's trying to work her way up in law enforcement so she's competing with men in you know firing guns she's competing with men in intellectual ways and it shows and it shows the way she's both dismissed and objectified there was thought put into that and I really think that's great I'm five chapters into the next book in the series Hannibal um so far so good um it shows the way things worked out for Clarice after her star rose suddenly after killing the Buffalo Bill serial killer and so far if you've seen the movie we're doing all right that they, they stuck with it pretty well and I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. If not, well, I won't remember anybody. <laughs> so um, it's starting to get starting to get to be about that time. So I'm gonna take my poor little kids out and treat them to a nice dinner before they have to go back to school. And I hope you are staying safe. I hope the world is treating you well. And let's hope the remote control works in turning off the camera. Bye. It didn't work. <laughs>